Académie académique. Je suis contente que vous soyez quand même aussi nombreux euh, malgré euh, euh, les conditions euh, et la situation sanitaire. Donc, euh, comme vous savez peut-être, le cycle de conférences à Cross existe maintenant 5 ans. On est très fiers. Donc, euh, un échange euh, entre euh, la partie française et d'architecture qui fait vraiment venir euh, de manière régulière euh, des francophones en Flandre, des jeunes bureaux francophones en Flandre et des jeunes bureaux néerlandophones euh, en Wallonie grâce à nos partenaires euh, Apres Architecture in Belgium, Uliège et euh, le Vlaams Architecture Institute. Donc ce soir, nous, nous avons le plaisir d'accueillir Kinerik Architecte. Kinerik Architecte, ce euh, sont trois voilà, vous les voyez tous les trois. Il y a Lando de Kaiser, Lourdes Adrians et uh, Richard Young, Lung, euh, qui sont basés à Gand, d'une part, et à Shanghai. Donc en fait, ils font la navette. Euh, Richard est venu ce soir spécialement pour nous de Shanghai. Ça lui a fait un énorme problème avec les, 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 les conditions sanitaires que vous connaissez. Donc en fait, on est très euh, reconnaissants qu'ils sont venus ce soir ici. Euh, et comme en fait, on ne fait pas seulement ce croisement euh, à travers euh, la frontière linguistique pour les jeunes bureaux, mais on, a, on demande toujours aussi à un bureau établi de faire l'introduction. Donc ce soir, en fait, nous avons le plaisir d'avoir une introduction de Pierre Vettorio Aurélie, qui est euh, un des associés du bureau Dogme de euh, basé à Bruxelles. Pour des raisons euh, Corona, il n'a pas pu faire venir en personne, mais il nous a envoyé un petit film. Donc, en fait, il va faire son, son introduction par Zoom, en direct, tout à l'heure. Euh, et donc, voilà, je, je pense que je voudrais donner la parole d'abord à Pierre Vittorio Aurélie et après euh, aux architectes. Euh, par contre, je voudrais encore remercier les étudiants, parce qu'on est par Grams euh, Obrecht, d'autre part la Fédération Wallonie Bruxelles et puis la, euh, la région Bruxelles Capitale et aussi euh, notre sponsor euh, Dieter Iman. Voilà, merci pour votre attention et euh, I would like to ask you to put on Pierre Vittorio. Uh, good evening, uh, my name is Pierre Vittorio Aureli, uh, I'm an architect, uh, I'm a, a founder together with Martino Tattara of the office Dogma. I'm also a teacher at the Architecture Association uh, and uh, the Yale School of Architecture. Uh, tonight, uh, I have the pleasure uh, to uh, introduce uh, uh, the office Generic, uh, which is formed by three uh, architects, uh, Lawrence uh, Adrians, uh, Lando de Kaiser, and Richard Leung. Uh, it's a very a pleasant uh, uh, opportunity to introduce the lecture because I know uh, them uh, since a long time. Uh, I know their work, uh, I know their practice, their projects, uh, and of course I shared uh, a lot of experiences and also uh, research interest uh, uh, and beliefs uh, in what architecture, uh, what architecture should be and what architecture uh, is about. So I, I have a, uh, really a, a sense of kinship, uh, let's say, with their, uh, with their work. Um, I think it's, uh, it's very interesting to, uh, to note how a uh, younger generation of architects, uh, and this is cer certainly the case of uh, generic, uh, there is more and more an interest uh, to confront uh, uh, the uh, architecture most uh, uh, urgent uh, uh, issues. Uh, Um, I think this is some a concern that is uh, more and more on the rise, uh, but very few actually practices are uh, then able to really express uh, those concerns uh, in a very specific, uh, let's say, architectural approach. And this is very much for me the case of, uh, of generic. Um, in a way, the title of the office is already a program uh, in itself. Uh, generic, of course, is a word that uh, often Uh, architects don't like to use because there is this kind of uh, uh, mantra that architecture has to be always very specific. Uh, but sometimes uh, a generic approach uh, is very productive, especially when one deals with questions uh, such as housing, uh, uh, domestic space, and urban design. 
uh, also because these conditions have been uh, have reached a scale uh, that is that cannot be uh, specific solutions and often they really require a more general uh, a general approach that can be identified as, as generic um, the lecture tonight uh, uh, that is presented by uh, generic uh, by Lando, Richard, and uh, uh, Lawrence uh, um, will uh, show you uh, interesting projects they have done in the past, uh, but somehow they will discuss these projects uh, within a very specific uh, uh, context that is the one of Flanders uh, uh, and, and Belgium, let's say, also in general. And you might be aware that, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, the Flemish uh, uh, territory uh, has uh, a very specific uh, uh, urban form, uh, which at first looked like uh, uh, very suburban and, and sprawling, uh, uh, but nevertheless, uh, as you might know very well, was really the outcome of a specific political uh, and social uh, policy, which uh, in fact uh, is at work from uh, from very long time. And, and this policy actually to summarize it in a very in a very rudimental way uh, was uh, uh, trying to basically promote uh, home ownership uh, and encourage people to live uh, as much as possible in what we can consider single family houses uh, this created a very specific uh, uh, landscape a specific urban form which i think is increasingly becoming uh, problematic it goes actually without saying but I think the most uh, uh, crucial problems are not just uh, environmental or, or also have to do with the promoted, uh, uh, which of course uh, is exactly what a generic try to uh, challenge with their uh, with their work. Uh, I have to say that uh, I feel very uh, very close to this uh, project, uh, also dogma. We have been very, uh, very much focused on questions of domesticity, and it's not just its architectural, but also its social and political uh, implications. So I'm, I'm extremely happy to see that their work is really uh, putting very interesting issues uh, on the table from uh, this point of view. But I also uh, like the fact that uh, Generic is also an office committed to architecture in, in the most uh, basic and, and fundamental way. And I think uh, this is for me uh, today uh, a huge uh, challenge, especially when you want to uh, raise the stakes uh, uh, of, your, of your work in terms of program, in terms of themes that uh, you want to address. To remain committed to architecture is, uh, is very important. Uh, is very vital uh, and I am very happy that tonight uh, they will have a chance to show you actually how uh, their body of work, which is actually very interesting, uh, is uh, beginning actually to uh, reflect uh, not just actually their own personal position, but uh, larger issues, larger problems that affect us uh, all. So for that reason, I. I feel very happy that they have this chance to uh, present to you uh, the work. I uh, feel uh, sorry that I could not be uh, there. Unfortunately, the circumstances of COVID uh, have prevented me <laughs> to, be, uh, to be present uh, uh, there uh, tonight, but uh, I'm extremely, really, uh, extremely happy to send this video and to send my actually uh, utmost uh, support uh, for their work uh, and for their, let's say, future uh, as architects, but also as, uh, let's say, uh, uh, intellectuals uh, whose contribution to architecture will be about building, but will also be about reinforcing uh, a critical discourse about architecture in the next uh, in the next years. So, thanks a lot, uh, and. Uh, uh, Lawrence, uh, Lando, and Richard, uh, well, uh, good luck and uh, have, a, have a good time. Bye.
Good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, uh, we would like to thank the audience for being here, um, both physically and virtually. Uh, we would also like to thank uh, Pierre Petolio really for the kind words and the unique introduction. Um, also, we would like to thank the VIE, A+, and Faculté d'Architecture de l'Université de Liège for hosting us and giving us a platform to talk about architecture. Um, we are Henrik, as mentioned be multiple times before. Uh, this is Richard Lando, and I'm Lawrence. Um, our office is based in Ghent and in Shanghai. So you could say there is also a sort of a cross uh, condition within the office, sort of exchange between these two places. The first act of um, starting the office was actually uh, choosing a name. Uh, we chose uh, Henrik for specific reasons. The etymological roots of our name tries to approach, uh, tries to define our approach to architecture. Henrik in Eng in, uh, is a tra uh, Dutch translation of the word generic, which means as much as not specific. But uh, um, the, the roots of the etymological, uh, etymological word is uh, find in Latin, uh, where it defines a, uh, a sort, kind of race, relating to the classification and organizing of commonalities between desperate entities. But also, it uh, talks about origin and birth. So this relationship between organization and life uh, reflects our architecture. Because we see only that um, through the appropriation of, uh, uh, of architecture as an organizing framework, one can Life, uh, life can truly uh, exist. So we see architecture as a sort of framework and the classification of uh, life and w wherein uh, it unfolds. Also in a later phase, uh, the word uh, generique also has a relationship to the word, uh, the French word generique, which means as much as uh, closing credits. After a film or uh, a theater, uh, you have a sort of list with uh, the authors of the of the project um, present ourselves as uh, individuals, but rather as a group. Uh, the the lecture today is uh, together alone. It, uh, we're going to present six uh, single family houses, and we try to find a sort of uh, commonality between the, these projects and also try to incorporate uh, the team to talk a bit about the Flemish landscape. Uh, the title, Together Alone, is sort of a paradoxal a par paradox of opposites, with the purpose to, to talk a bit about uh, the range in between these two opposites. Crux to under understanding of, the, uh, of domesticity is the demarcation of land, and, and, uh, of land through the uh, plot structure. Toussaint Boulevard by um, uh, Stephen Shaw really uh, captivates this, uh, this essence and uh, really made us reflect about these things. The plot is always charged with the sort of dream of a building, but through the emptiness of this plot, um, one can also, also see sort of the condition where it is in. Um, so the, the, the commissions we get are only not, not only a sort of reflection about uh, the project itself, but also try to... Um, think about what is the bigger context, even if it's not within the commission, what is the bigger context wherein the house is, uh, is uh, in, uh, planted. Because we look at a uh, larger scale and the multi these multiple, uh, multitude of dreams also has a sort of flip side. Um, we, all have a, we all know these uh, problems that uh, are um, connected with uh, the suburbia and especially the Flemish landscape such as uh, land use, mobility, isolated social, social structure, water infiltration, and so on. So one could say that uh, the sort of the dreams of the, the individual initiative has sort of flip side and that uh, the, the whole, uh, the, whole as, uh, the landscape as a whole has become a sort of a nightmare. Uh, we, tried to, we will try to discuss the driving forces within this, our build investigation. Uh, within, we try to um, we'll try to discuss the driving forces within our built environment and investigate how, contem how contemporary life can be uh, uh, can be placed within this. 
Our first project is Plateau Villa. It's uh, located in Zwan. Uh, it's uh, it's in uh, Flanders. It's um, situated close to the uh, small village of uh, Berlehem. And on the primary, uh, on the left, you can see the sort of a primary road that connects uh, two villages. And, and through a sort of secondary road, the, the plot is connected. Uh, and on the right, it's um, it uh, connects with the sort of agricultural fields. But when zooming in more at the plot condition by itself, you also have this sort of um, front and back condition. On the front, you have a, a sort of road condition, which connects the plot to uh, uh, the urbanization of, of the landscape. And at the back, you have a sort of a, uh, a, protective, a protected forest. So this. Um, Opposites is also very present within this uh, specific within this specific plot, but also there's a, there's also sort of a more fundamental uh, way of living that is embedded within this sort of freestanding villa because uh, the regulations determine it can only uh, it can only have a sort of it has to have a certain distance. Uh, you you also have to uh, take your car to go out. Uh, there's so, a social uh, there's a sort of uh, mobility that is enforced on, upon you. And we try to really investigate how like daily life within a sort of family structure uh, can, can uh, be embedded within architecture. Um, a bit weird maybe to look at a, at a sort of reference is the, uh, or, uh, so we try to look for this uh, way of embedding life uh, to this, um, to true uh, uh, plans of uh, church typologies. Uh, more concrete, we looked at the Basilica di Santo Spirito in Florence by Brunelleschi. The plan with its typical cruciform architecture has a strong actual quality and a central nave with three aisles, which hold the collective uh, rituals and processions uh, within the space. But around this, uh, the plan, there's a sort of um, uh, side chapels uh, wrapped uh, in a way to give the, the space a sort of rhythm, but also uh, resolving a bit the connection between the uh, nave and the transept. And translating these sort of qualities and also a way of embedding life within a sort of uh, architectural structure, um, we also thought about this plot specific uh, in a way how can we. Uh, connect this front road condition with this uh, really um, picturesque uh, garden at the back. And how can, um, how, can, um, how can we organize the family structure within this um, body? The central space in our plan is sort of um, uh, the place for uh, social interactions within the family, while the rooms on both sides are uh, more generic rooms uh, and more for retreat of the personal uh, personal moments within family structure. This honest interior photo taken during a random moment before uh, completion doesn't show a uh, sort of staged or designed life. It portrays the logic of the central space as a spatial device to allow domestic rituals to happen. So. The central space is actually the, the moment where, where the father meets with the son or where, where the whole um, body of uh, social interactions is unfolded. But this container of, um, of a certain way of life um, was also a um, uh, To counter the, uh, the, the flooding, because on the, the fields on the right, they um, flood over uh, over the slope uh, of the plot, so there's a lot of risk of flooding. The the, the container of, of or the structure of the house is lifted on a sort of plinth, which would house the the garage and the storage space. And herein we saw a sort of potential of like uh, not claiming the entirety of the plot, but just like by lifting the house and creating a sort of a distance between the ground and the, and the, and the floor plan, uh, it creates sort of uh, autonomy and maybe it can be sort of a, a house that just oversees the landscape without, 
really um, marketing what is mine, what is what do I own. But upon completion, not only the color changed of the facade, but in uh, but uh, the, you can also notice that the, the really the, this idea about uh, uh, being lifted and detached from uh, nature in, in a way to preserve it is uh, by the um, really um, uh, fenced the, the entire plot in a way to uh, due to pr pragmatic reasons, like they want to have, let the dog out, they want to have, have the children uh, play. So this demarcation for us is also um, a way not only to, to, to it's not only, um, the demarcation of the plot is not only a sort of a prag a built uh, upon uh, pragmatic reasons, it's also sort of a, a way of conforming to a sort of social life that is accepted within this suburban en environment. A social life where um, these single family houses are always uh, constructed for a sort of nuclear family. The, the type of inhabitants that everybody sees, uh, where the father, the mother, the son, daughter, uh, live within the same condition. But um, I think even now, maybe more than uh, before the corona, uh, COVID crisis, I think this uh, family structure is really um, not the only way uh, we can live, I think, uh, contemporary life, or that that is how we experience, uh, then uh, and much more uh, in a shift and uh, variations than these uh, particular uh, than this typical uh, family. And in a way, to think about life uh, or the family structure that could uh, happen uh, within this house, we um, we also try to um, speculate on maps. These maps are not, um, let's say, a sort of um, uh, where we don't try to uh, put forward a sort of alternative, but it's sort of a, a way of testing our proposal and the typology that we uh, introduce on the site and how it could be extended uh, in a, uh, in a for, for multitudes and how it uh, can break free from the classical moments. In in response to, to this, we try to research and test our domestic spaces beyond the plot and the commission. These mental maps are made for each of our projects and we present tonight. And, and it is both a means to make and test our architecture typologies as a tool to reflect on the bigger context within our uh, projects. So we try to reflect on, on what is it to build a villa within the suburbia and it is how it is a, related to this family structure and how how can uh, we can make architecture that breaks free from this uh, containment of the plot size uh, in a way to to rethink uh, and uh, rethink ways of living um, this map was uh, has drawn uh, inspiration from the longhouse typology which was found in uh, various cultures uh, such as native uh, Americans, Indonesian, or even Viking settlements. And what interested our, our, the, us the most was the sort of um, how the, this container um, talks about a bigger sphere than the, the, the family that we know. How, um, how a community can uh, uh, live within, within one structure. The original building, constra con constrained by the plot and dimensions, enforces uh, to conform to a single family home. And there's a certain life. So, but the collage shows a sequence, this collage shows a sequence of households which are aligned through the uh, vertical, uh, the axis, and um, whereby they still be uh, attached. So this is sort of a, um, an attempt to rethink life from starting from the DNA of the, the project, but how how could it expand and how could it become a sort of a um, way to um, attack uh, certain kind of problems and try to define a sort of new way of living together, um, where one would have a, a sort of closer relationships to to other uh, families, 
but also sort of a particular way and a relationship to nature. And moving on to discuss more about this social relationships within the, the within domestic and and a certain sense of conformity, as Lawrence has suggested, within these suburban environments. Um, we will explore it through the project of Coordinate Villa. And this project is situated in, in Ost Eklo, it's still in Flanders, in Belgium. And the neighborhood that it belongs in actually is, belongs, uh, is slightly off a main circulation road. And so it has this kind of detached uh, atmosphere about it. And actually, when you go to the site itself, it's almost like walking into a set of Desperate Housewives. I'm not sure if some of you are too young to actually watch Desperate Housewives when you're young, but yes. Um, it's, it's, almost a, it's almost a quintessentially David Lynch feeling and atmosphere in this neighborhood when you actually enter. And it's perhaps owing to how the neighborhood is actually appendix from the road itself, thus creating a sense of insulation and isolation and our project is really amidst this orienta disorientation is really an attempt to seek a way of orientation within these environments. And common with these kind of neighborhoods is actually a prevalence of social conformity where if, uh, if that, that neighbor has a lawn that's beautifully manicured, manicured, I also kind of need a lawn that's beautifully manicured, something like this. And this, this is used as a way of establishing a, a sort of sense of belonging even while the plots themselves are heavily individualized and isolated. Or is perhaps because of this individualization with each of these plots and the social isolation that it, it, it entails that there's a compulsion to uh, have that sense of belonging. And a reminder of that it re really is this film, American Beauty, um, although in America, but I think it's still a strong correlation. And in this particular scene is where the character that Kevin Spacey plays lashes out at the dinner table, unable to hold the pressure of the social conformity of this ideal of suburban dream. And against the very backdrop of this very picturesque and ideal, idealized scenario of uh, what we would associate a suburban dinner table to be. But as we move towards the project, uh, we take inspiration from John Heddock's North, South, East, West House where in the plan it separates, uh, the walls separate four different unique conditions within the house. But yet as much as the four walls divide, they also define. At the very all four of the walls come together. They join, they coordinate, and they orientate. And translating these ideas, these fundamentals into the projects, these four walls define different rooms within the ground plan, uh, the living space, the big one, and storage, the garage for the car, and the bedrooms. And at the very point of intersection, the walls open up for circulation between these four quadrants. As you transition from one, you can clearly see the other rooms. And thus your face, at the very moment, you're faced with a choice and decision, and the clarity of the direction you take. And the circulation is not induced, it's not like a free flow thing, like where, where it's kind of trendy, where or uh, you don't need to think about the circulation itself, but, but rather the conditions are made explicit of these quadrants, allowing for the inhabitant to make the choice at the coordinate to which room he wants to enter and what conditions those rooms are. In a way, it becomes the origin point of the building. And in section, um, conforming to the plot regulations, uh, we created the pitch roof for the house uh, with additional volume on top, and between the volume on top and on the ground, uh, storage is sandwiched in between. But this volume on top is also transformed into something akin to a lookout post. The very sense of securitization, the kind of neighborly warmness. Uh, and the a uniform envelope is applied to the building. And in this case, it's uh, corrugated aluminum creating almost a sense of uh, like a reflective fortress of domesticity. But when all is said and done, this, this project is not really an attempt to say reinvent the wheel and create something insanely new. But because in its essence, it is actually still a suburban house. 
but, but rather it's a reworking of our typological reading of the typical suburban house and to look beyond its current constraints. And with the socially alienating tendencies pertinent to the, sub the, uh, to the suburbs, it's also an imperative to discover typologies of collective living. And in this case, um, the dividing walls of the house can possibly extend outwards. Uh, in this case, hedges, adjoining with that of adjacent houses, obviously uh, assuming that we multiply and replicate these uh, typology. And forming a series of uh, new shared rooms or gardens as they come and join together, these new dividing uh, strategies. And with each quadrant in a house forming part of a collective room that's also shared by three other houses. And this is done as a as means to move beyond the isolation, the alienation, and the securitization that's so often characterized by these sort of neighborhoods. To suggest a way of living that can overcome this. And using uh, typology as an apparatus and a device to explore the way of life and the forces that perpetuate within the suburbs. In, in an attempt to understand the state of mind, the subjectivity that flows throughout, the, uh, throughout Flanders. And so this brings us to the, net, the next project, uh, Crosshouse. Actually, to, to further explore this phenomenon of suburbia, ironically, we go to the city, um, the city of Ghent. Um, and actually, like this project, Crosshouse, is, is a kind of special commission also to us because it was our first commission, and it actually kind of allowed us to, to start our co collaboration and to start our office. So again, it is a commission for a, for a single family house, and um, the plot, as you can see, is, is located in the city center of, of Ghent. More specifically, it's in Patershol, um, which is characterized by narrow streets. It's a medieval district uh, with uh, medieval streets and also quite dense and complex uh, built fabric. And what kind of fascinated us is, of course, the location uh, of the plot, which is in the inside of the block. So it's, you cannot experience the plot from the streets. You have to actually enter uh, the garden to, to access the plot. Um, and I, we were kind of intrigued uh, by, by this garden. Um, so before we actually went on site uh, to visit the plot, we also digged up a bit the history of this location, and we actually found that, yeah, it used to be um, a monastery and a school um, back in 1906, where you can see that actually the, the garden is really a collective um, space that kind of connects all the separate buildings of the school. And in the back here, you can see um, the concierge house, which is actually the, the house, yeah, the location of, of our project. Um, but when we went over, and we didn't include the photo, but um, to the site, we actually found a complete uh, abandoned garden, sort of wilderness, where no one was actually there, and all the, the, the buildings uh, from the school are actually not used, so they are empty. Um, so, in this condition, for us, it was a big challenge and also maybe an opportunity to kind of rethink a house that could also maybe re-evaluate the, the courtyard itself. Um, also, because the, the existing house, the concierge house, you can see was in a really bad state and it needed to be demolished because of uh, structural issues. So, um, here you can see a site plan of the project. Um, and for us, it was a bit, because it was also our first project, um, I, I think we were also a bit scared of the context and we didn't really want to refer directly to the context. So, we were kind of um, fascinated by the idea to install sort of autonomous framework towards this collective uh, space. And the first intervention uh, for us was maximizing the, the, the building um, plot because you can see here uh, that the concierge warning is, is actually a bit to the back. And with the new project, we wanted to put the facade really uh, in the front facing, facing the garden. Um, 
So this is an important intervention, but also to kind of include all the program that was requested by the clients, we had to think about uh, of a typology of a high rise of a tower. Um, and because we had to stack four levels to kind of put all the program in. So we, we defined the project actually as a tower, which has a, a core with all the services and the stair and an open space that is actually um, also subdivided in four quarters. Um, you can see the DNA of the project, um, the, the structure actually that we installed and that kind of does several things at once. It connects the project um, within its context. It's almost like the project is inserted in an existing condition, an envelope of existing wall. So to stabilize this wall, we needed a sort of structure uh, to keep uh, to kind of guarantee the stability of the, of the walls where we put the project in. But on the other hand, at the same time, with this structure, um, we kind of have a device to organize the, the project itself. Um, so here we can see the plan of the balletage of the first floor, uh, where you can clearly also see the, the stair and the kitchen, which are in the, the core. Um, um, zone and then the central zone, which is actually like just the open floor plan, uh, whereas the whereas also the living room and, and the kitchen, and there is also a triangular uh, terrace which tries to emphasize also on the corner condition of the of the plot. Um, so here you can see an image of uh, of the photographer Johnny, where you can clearly see like this cross which is kind of present in the ceiling. Um, but actually allows uh, the house to be completely open. And at the back, you can see the, the stair and the kitchen who are like integrated in the core. This is an, uh, another image uh, facing actually the garden and the, the triangular terrace. So what we actually wanted to do with this, this house was also um, really uh, making sort of framework uh, um, which is timeless and would also outlive the inhabitants. Uh, so, by 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 making this cross, uh, the floor can there is a sort of organization that is suggested, but you can keep the whole floor open. But in the opposite of that, you can also with this cross define rooms. Uh, you can define two rooms, or you can define four rooms, as in this case, um, where we are on the bedroom floor. And we can recognize to to uh, you can see that there are two children bedrooms and a bathroom. So here is a, a sequence uh, of photos who are taken from the opposite of uh, the opposite room towards the bedroom, the hallway, another bedroom, uh, the bathroom, sorry, and the, the bed, another bedroom. And and this logic of this framework and plan, we also kind of wanted to expose in the facade. So here you can see the facade of the house um, where there is a very clear distinction in between the core at the right and the, the house itself or the program of the house on the left where we kind of wanted to make almost like an abstract, the, the facade as an abstract surface with six openings, uh, one opening for every possible room. Um, also, like you can see the, the triangle terrace that kind of tries to negotiate with the context and with the historical wall on the left. So, I, what is going back to the larger context after explanation, the, the house itself. Um, for us, um, as much as the, the concrete structure on the inside is a sort of um, anchor, also the facade as a surface is a sort of promise for a future possible development of this courtyard. So here you can see also a map that we that we made and I think we because this is also important like for us um, when we are designing this project this is about of course the context and trying to understand it. But on the other hand uh, by thinking beyond the individual plot about a bigger ID and, and this ID sometimes also helps us to define or to make choices in the, the project itself. So, so here, 
um, the front facade is actually um, seen almost as a backbone to redevelop or develop the, the block, the, the building block from the inside, almost as a complement to the, to the existing uh, condition of, of the street facing houses. Sort of new layer of houses is integrated in the center. Uh, and they, as you can see in the collage, they share um, collective uh, garden. And this facade is, is sort of primary primary framework where new houses can actually almost be uh, plugged into. Um, and the new houses also go into dialogue with with existing, ha existing houses at the back while they share a collective garden. <laughs> but of course, uh, we also, uh, <laughs> have to face uh, reality and after the, the delivery of the project um, yeah we, we, witness, we witnessed that also these clients although in the city um, they they made sorts they, they uh, yeah they claimed their their plot by fencing it and also putting a lawn and maybe I the reason for this is also that um, all the individual uh, houses of, uh, that are are actually connected with this, this this courtyard, they are private property today. Eh? So, to to kind of really establish or, or think of a bigger idea, the private partners together to create this collective um, courtyard is, is is not that evident. And and for sure, because our project was was actually maybe the first project within this development. So we also realize that that uh, the reality is, is is different from from our ideas um, and actually what we also learned from this is that maybe suburbia is the phenomenon of suburbia is not really um, something that is uh, typical to only the sprawl so the, the neighborhood condition from uh, coordinates but it's actually maybe more of a mindset of ownership, uh, claiming your plot, and we also clearly see that. And I, probably the, it's also quite complex um, uh, thinking beyond it, like um, behind it, like a feeling of security feel for the children and everything that exists amongst us, uh, everyone. So, so this is the story of Cross House. The next house uh, we're going to present is a strip house uh, located in uh, Zilte. It's also uh, um, more uh, of a typical plot within the suburbia, where you have a sort of a street on the front, then a sort of buildable zone and, and a garden in the, at the back. The, the very long, uh, it has a very long dimension, the plot. But what was most uh, interesting is, uh, you, you can see the plot on the right, and what was most interesting uh, for us was actually the sort of already existing neighbor. And uh, it's a sort of a semi-detached um, house, and, um, and you have to um, comply to these regulations. So there are actually, um, on, on the plot, there are also sort of um, uh, regulations uh, placed upon. So, you, uh, the, the typology could not be a sort of freestanding or like a, a row house. It has to be uh, detached to the, to the neighbor and then has to have a, a free zone next to it. But in reality, these, uh, which you can see on the left, these uh, dead zones are often used as a, as, as a, a car parks or a, Left, it's probably it's mostly a leftover space, <clears throat> and these uh, regulations dictate a very uh, specific uh, architectural form, and that we uh, associate uh, with uh, Flemish suburbia. But they also um, they also uh, define sort of an iconography of of the of how, what we see and how how does the how, how do we perceive the landscape. But also embeds sort of a social structure where you have to conform to your neighbor. Our proposal really tries to um, accept these regulations and try to change the, the 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 architecture from within. So the sort of basic DNA was um, uh, strips 
uh, grew from the the fact that we had to keep on the right a sort of a, a build-free zone, and it was uh, dictated by regulations that had to be three meters. Translating this uh, this this into the plan, um, on the left we organized the the more um, rooms, let's say, where on top uh, you have on top and bottom you have the rooms with a, a view, and in central you have the heart. The second strip is actually sort of a service strip, which uh, households uh, the stair, toilets, uh, kitchen, and bathrooms, and act uh, is sort of a threshold between the individual rooms and the living space on the right. The living space is a, a continuous open space uh, where we uh, would just apply the the the, the, the floor and, and, and life uh, of the inhabitants could uh, could uh, take form. But uh, we really um, try to incorporate this sort of a specificity of the dead zone or the unbuildable air, uh, strip on the right, and try to um, see the benefits of them by. Uh, um, Incorporating uh, by incorporating it within the the architectural framework of the of the of the house, so there's a soft uh, division. There's a soft division between the living space uh, here centrally seen and on the right the the dead space, which could be uh, incorporated as a terrace or uh, or a garden. On the left, there's the more uh, sort of wall condition that would separate the uh, individual life from the um, collective life. What was really at stake for us and how we tried to perceive this building was uh, by really think, rethinking the the ground floor and how does the ground floor, uh, how you could uh, incorporate uh, the, the, the sort of unbuildable space by uh, um, the regulations define that uh, you can put fences uh, everywhere uh, and these fences could be like uh, two meter uh, high. So we use that as that condition as sort of a uh, starting point to start design. The the fence would be translated in similar mullions towards uh, uh, towards the on the ground floor. I would frame the whole plot. On on top of them, on top of that, uh, it's actually sort of a, a sort of a let's say, room for the subjectivity, because the clients actually really wanted a sort of a white cube, uh, modern house. And we just placed that on, on top, uh, because for us, it's, the, the story was not, or like what was at stake was not uh, designing this uh, specific house, but was more like researching how within these regulationships, uh, how within regulations, how we can uh, redefine uh, living. This model really shows what, what, um, how we uh, org organize this uh, project. It's the front, the front um, garden and the, the yard at the back are really left open, and really we try to define the client to have a, a terrace, open living room, uh, all within this uh, buildable zone. And by retra retraining, uh, retreat, uh, by uh, retraining ourselves um, to only this zone, we could uh, and uh, and leave the rest as sort of uh, access. We could uh, challenge this typology from within these regulations. So, if we would contain, let's say, the the house within this uh, uh, margin, there would be a, a enormous space at the back open for a, a different way of living. We we saw this as sort of a park uh, condition where. Uh, the adjacent family would have a sort of relationship to, through the space that they share. So, and maybe also they would have um, qualities within their life that they would otherwise not have. So for us, the pro this, uh, this project was really like a sort of investigation on how this uh, sort of um, stacking of families next to each other, how, how this can be a bit of erased and blurred by um, putting a limit or a border of what, what is um, individualized within the family and how can we share something with our neighbor. 
because that's also uh, a feeling that we uh, think is um, very present in these um, situations where they you feel insulated and you you don't have a lot of co contact but maybe by uh, sharing a, a sort of a garden or, or park this would um, uh, cre uh, create a new social dynamics that um, within, within the neighborhood okay um so the next project forest villa actually is also uh, challenged by specific uh, regulations um similar to the strip house uh, but also different um, so here you can see the context of this uh, project um, actually it's a triangular plot um, and almost as a sort of leftover plot uh, where no one wanted to build on uh, in a luxurious neighborhood uh, this plot is located in, in Berlichen, in St. Martin's Flat, and, um, which is south of, of Ghent, um, where you can easily, uh, where you can see that the territory itself, it used to be a forest, but uh, a forest that also couldn't escape from the suburban sprawl, and where you can see that uh, the different parcels are, are, are present, and also um, trees are cut down to create uh, private gardens. So when we take a look at the site plan of this project, um, you can also already see our project, our proposal. Um, but um, what's, what we found interesting is, okay, um, it's a small plot um, with maybe no particular qualities, uh, except maybe from the, from the shape of the triangle. Um, because when we, when we went there, we could see that maybe the plot itself has not many qualities but the adjacent plot had a forest and actually like uh, for us it was immediately clear that we wanted to orientate the house towards this forest and almost because also the plot is already orientated towards forests we thought about kind of within the regulations which are that we had to conform to a setback from the from the boundary of the plot of three meters at street side and four meters at the adjacent neighbors, we kind of literally uh, built the house uh, also. Um, we maximized the footprint of the house uh, within this plot. And so we, we have this triangular um, house. Um, because yeah, also this plot is so small that even, even as you can see it now, it's, it's actually not enough for, for the it was not enough for the clients to completely uh, organize the, the program of, of what they wanted. So um, here you can see sort of exploded OXO um, where uh, you can see um, where actually there are, you can subdivide three uh, elements. Um, there is the facade that kind of protects the house uh, from from the environment, from the street and the adjacent neighbor. There is the, the, the program itself, which is almost inserted into this facade. And there is also an additional volume and annotated uh, with, the, with the completely glazed facade towards the forest. And there is also the addition on, on the roof uh, to kind of conform to, to the requirements of, of the clients. Uh, but again, for us, the story of this project is about the ground floor. Um, so here you can see an external collage uh, from the street side where we can clearly uh, see the solid facade uh, with small regular openings uh, for windows and separating the more intimate condition of the domestic interior away from, from the streetscape. Where on the, on the other side of the house, on the back of the house, there is an open glazing that fully embraces the view towards the forest. And here you can see a plan of the ground floor of the project. Uh, you can also see that we perceive this project almost as a, a cut-off typology of a bigger arc, um, building, um, where the diagonal facade is almost a section, and the, the house is actually organized um, accordingly, so 
with a set of rooms at the border, the facades, ex external facade, and then a sort of uh, collective space in the middle. So sequenced, we have uh, the entrance on the left and then a stair, some storages with the kitchen and then two bedrooms on the ground floor with the master bedroom on top as requested by the client. Um, so, so this collage um, kind of emphasizes the idea of this project. It's, it's uh, also like the other projects, we also try to think beyond the plot, but in this case, it was really present already, um, the quality, um, saying that the forest, although it's not owned by the clients, it is a very, uh, for, I, it's, it's clear that this is the biggest quality um, in this uh, environment. So rather than being subjected to the overall tendency to build and to use plots of plants, uh, for us it's clear that even though the forest is not owned by the clients, it's actually the most uh, interesting part. So to go further on the, the, the experiment that we always do, we also created this, this map where we were thinking of uh, four of, of these forest houses um, that kind of frame a forest and kind of protect this forest as their garden. Instead of cutting out garden uh, trees to, to create a, a private garden, uh, in this map you can see actually four houses uh, where the plot lines actually are dissolved and where a big plot exists and, and is uh, shared by four houses who share a collective garden. Um, and where the villas actually serve as a corner of, of, of a greater typolo typological uh, vision. Um, so this is um, a collage uh, of this uh, ID. Um, I think it's also clear that I, um, from this collage, you can also understand maybe more individual projects and uh, the framing and sort of um, collective garden and yeah I think I don't know <laughs> so <that's been> <laughs> itself <laughs> as well um, um, I think what the projects uh, Lawrence and Nando described earlier on uh, some of the themes the recurring themes are the relationship between uh, plot boundaries and the social dynamics that we experience within the built environment and to push it even further and to further explore this we'll go to the project Slope House back into the city in Ghent, Belgium. Um, it's a three-story building and on the street side there is a historical facade that's meant to be conserved um, and it faces an interior courtyard at the back. Uh, the site is kind of similar to Cross House, but radically different in the sense that this courtyard, there is a chaotic mix of volumes, all these kind of uh, funny volumes like Lego blocks kind of just amalgamating inside. And this, this, the reason for this kind of volumetric in this interior courtyard in the city is really owing to the regulations of uh, neighborly offsets whenever you build a building. And with the depth of the plot, it's actually relatively quite deep. The, uh, we propose to separate the plan with a call right in the middle. So we divide uh, each floor plan into two rooms. Uh, first of all, with the practicality of getting natural lights into the rooms on both facades, but also to really explore the possibility of that duality of the project from both fronts and rear. And this is a sectional collage that we did. Um, and in the front, facing the street side, there will be standardly dimensioned rooms between the front facade and the core. And between the core uh, and the rear facade, uh, different sized rooms will be created owing to the sloping facade. And on the ground floor, because of the partition wall of the neighboring garden, uh, the ceiling will be opened up, creating a double height space that allows for natural light to flood in. The front facade is, a, is the conserved historical facade and the street expression of the identity of the architecture, well, historically. The rear facade is a slope glazed facade. And while it's a, it was, as you can see previously, it was a straightforward manner of organizing the different sizes of rooms 
sectionally, but it was also pragmatic for, uh, for the reason of rain runoff. But this slope facade, simply beyond just an architectural form, is really a result of a very rigorous negotiation of setback requirements from neighboring plots, and most notably offsets away from the built extent of the neighboring plot, with uh, some dry details, say 60 centimeters from the building edge of the neighbor and 1.9 meter uh, of, uh, from, the, from any windows of the neighbors. And this is all done in kind of, this kind of, these 1.9 and 0.6 meters are not values created by us. These are actually plot regulations. And these were all done to maintain visual separation with the neighbors themselves in the justification of maintaining privacy. And one can therefore see that these regulations operate as almost an active tool in which to negate the presence and existence of the neighbor to really enforce the individual house as an isolated enclave of inhabitation, of being alone. But yet the irony in all this is that lines of sites with the immediate adjacent neighbor are denied. The project still exists within the inner courtyard where views are established from neighbors uh, and laterally, or right in front, right across the courtyard. And, and therefore the inner courtyard is really an intensified paradox uh, of at once living in a domestic space of isolation, but also very presently confronted with the reality of living with others. And, and therefore a sort of voyeurism and securitization ensues, and that of which is so unlike uh, what we explored in the coordinate villa. And with a fully glazed facade, the aspect of being together but yet alone is really fully pushed to the limits. And the inhabitants both in the position of the observer of all that happens in the courtyard, but simultaneously also subject to the same observation from their neighbors where at nights the intimate happenings of the interior is fully exposed, like what time you cook, whether you watch the TV, these are all very much revealed uh, in this condition. And as with all our projects, we like to explore it further in the, in the understanding of the context, and this deviates slightly from our other collective plans, uh, was more scaled up and more zoomed in. Um, in this case, the vertical call in plan repeats itself in the middle of the row houses, creating a kind of a continuity, of course. But what separates is really only the partition wall between plots, the boundary line, really. And facing the inner courtyard will be a series of uh, glazed facades. And aside from the offsets required by the regulation, this exploration of in, within the collage, uh, the building forms are fully glazed, so apart from the 0 0.6 and the 1.9 meter that we talked about earlier on. Uh, the voyeurism actually present here itself really is a manifestation of a kind of alienation that, a social alienation in, in specific, that contemporary domesticity creates. The, the simultaneity of being made aware of the existence of others, but yet almost trapped in your own bubble, your, your own space of isolation, creating this tension of voyeurism of once of curiosity, what is the neighbor doing? You know, you're, you're kind of trapped in these bubbles, like you're really curious, neighbor A, what is he doing? Neighbor B, uh, the, they have an argument, something like this. I mean, we are all at some point kind of curious about things like these, aren't we? And, and I think what aptly, the, this film by Alfred Hitchcock, Real Windows, really absolutely encapsulates this condition this uh, very moments of uh, voyeuristic observation, um, the very sense of comfort and security that one supposedly feels in your space of inhabitation becomes strongly challenged. Um, where I'm not sure if you guys have watched this, but in this film, there is this man kind of observing a crime scene happening, all within the comfort of his own home, but I don't want to spoil it, but somehow it comes back to him that he's, in the end, somehow ends up being in the person in danger. So it's really like the awareness of the existence of others and exposed in their most intimate moments uh, is all, also a haunting reminder that we, that we ourselves are subject to the same exposure to others. And in that sense also starts questioning whether the comforts and the 
satisfaction that we feel in our space, in our domestic space, is real or not. And now going back to our collective plans, it is really uh, to look beyond the individual villas and houses uh, that we built, or not, not really only the ones we built, as more than simply singular objects, like sculptural things in the landscape, but really as a typological framework that might be able to enable new ways of living collectively, um, overriding the isolating and alienating way of life that planning policies and building regulations have enforced. And, and actually in doing these maps, I think it was also a recognition that these regulations and policies have over the built environment. And, and to a certain extent, architects hit a certain ceiling afterwards that we can't really bridge this, uh, these regulations. And what we're doing here is really tr trying to attempt to work within these regulations, but at the same time also against them. So therefore, as a, to use these maps and collages to understand really how the built environment has conditioned in us our assumption of what a house and what a home is, from property ownership to the family life and a nuclear family that is induced by the architecture. I think amidst this COVID and corona crisis, it, uh, we kind of also have to deal with this very significant problem right now. But I think also during lockdown, I, a lot of it has been revealed to a lot of us that uh, of this increased awareness of that social alienation, domestic space of like you know, wanting to see people. Just simply simple as that, you know. And and yeah, exactly because of that, the actual importance of tangible social contacts. And so we we end the lecture with this image, and this is part of the series called Intimate Distance by Todd Hiddo. His an American photographer. Although in the context of the United States, I think it really strongly encapsulates a fundamental essence of what we are trying to talk about and what we're exploring as an office, um, on how the house is an embodiment, an amalgamation, or really of uh, private property ownership, the dream of the single family life. And with that, it's really, and thus the social alienation becomes one of our making, really of that of living together, but yet still so alone. Thank you. Preferably in English. Preferably in English. That's your question. I would like to ask, I have two questions actually. Um, my first question is that, um, as you just showed, you uh, have uh, developed um, a, a quite conceptual and also quite radical idea of what living can be and how li living together uh, can be or could be, and to give other uh, ideas of what the typology of uh, living, how the, the typology of living could ev uh, evaluate. And I was wondering because um, you mentioned it in, in two different projects that, of course, um, you, you have, are, conf are, are confronted sometimes with the, the client who maybe is not always on the same uh, level with, with the thinking you, you're doing. And I think it's, um, it's interesting because you, are, you talked a lot about regulation. And the, the, the boundaries of the, the limits of the regulations, but there's also the limits of the, um, of, the of the client and of the, the ambitions of the client and of the the, 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 the the living dream of the client. And I was wondering how are you coping with that because it's something that um, to realize a project, of course, you are always realizing this together with the client. So what is your do you have developed a, a kind of strategy to communicate with the client and to um, to to make him or her more um, familiar with the way you are thinking and working? Should I take this? Or? Well, um, I think to a certain extent, uh, 
uh, private clients are definitely a tougher bunch to deal with because they all have their personal preferences and and there's always a couple of discussions of what they want the house to be. But on the note of, say, for example, cross house, where they put a piece of grass and fence it up uh, in front, I, I think we are not the kind of architects to say, no, you cannot have the piece of lawn, but rather it's more of through that an observation for us of a larger subjectivity that, that really is like, is not just these clients, but is a subjectivity that is embedded within all of us in what we think a house should be. But in a certain way, like our houses are really just typologies. So we really allow the client to live as they wish. So if you want to include the lawn, you can. But really by doing so, for us, it's more of a takeaway that of an observation of the larger context. The maps that we show, the larger maps that we show, we don't actually show to the clients. Um, it might get quite scary for people, to be honest, because as I say, I wouldn't say like they haven't reached a level, but like their priorities might be different and, and they might not be too uh, open to things like these. And, and we kind of keep it on the down low a little bit with things like these. And, um, and this kind of more collective agenda is more really uh, the basis for our research rather than shoving it down our client's throat or something some similar to that, yeah. Uh, it's a very simple question, but you, you are based in Ghent and in Shanghai, but you only show, have shown uh, projects in Belgium and Flanders. Are you also working on projects in uh, Shanghai? And if yes, which ones? And if not, how is the influence that you are uh, having, I suppose, on or, or the, the external view that you as a, as a, as a Chinese person are having on uh, the, the environment in, in Belgium? How is this influencing your work? Oh, so me again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly state state it. Yeah, we work through Dropbox and <laughs> and Skype. Um, but I think, to be quite honest, one of the very early reasons why I left back to Asia was really visa problems. Just yeah. as simple as that. Um, but I think, for for me, being kind of stepping back from the scene of Belgium, which also puts me in a, in a position of observing from the outside. Whereas uh, Lawrence and Lando, they've grown up here, they're very familiarized uh, with things that happen in Belgium. Uh, I think sometimes you also get caught in the moment because you're so in, in, in it, You because you're also to a certain extent influenced by it. Am I right? Am I wrong? Yeah. <laughs> okay. But also yeah. sort of, a, it's a combination, I think, of the observing, uh, viewpoint of Richard, but also sort of more uh, the fine feelings that and the nuances in between uh, in between the these things that London and I have by growing up here mm, within mm. this uh, and living within these neighborhoods yeah. and observing them from from really like the the first person viewpoint. Mm, yeah. I think it's sort of this rich uh, match of like yeah. a first person and a ob observer yeah. finding somewhere. Uh, yeah. And we also have to say, I have to say, like it's also quite challenging for us to to work within two places on on the same projects. But I think we have all experienced it in the COVID times that, yeah, we by necessity we need to work online together. And for us, we were actually already kind of used <laughs> yeah. to that. So, um, like but, but, but it's it's strange because mostly when when you uh, when you uh, define projects or you design, you're together on the table and most sketching and testing drawings but uh, we are actually really uh, drawing on the computer and one person is drawing when we are the three of us talking um, about what to draw <laughs> or how we could uh, approach the project so I, yeah for us it's actually um, yeah we are pretty used to it kind of used to it yeah, yeah. and you're not building in china uh no we would love to if any no one's chinese here <laughs> um it's a whole different ball game, the market there. So that will take another t maybe one or two lectures to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> but also because for this, we don't only build and design for Belgium and Flanders, uh, but it's also owing to the across theme of kind of like exchanging between Wallonia and Flanders. 
that we want to kind of present uh, these series of projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also to be honest, like most of the commissions is from like the friends or family sphere, and that's mm -hmm. how I think to t transit from uh, working for somebody and then doing your own stuff, you need a little bit of like connections, and then yeah. we hope to get the ball rolling. It's also a, this unique commission in, in Belgium, or uh, especially also Flanders, or maybe also Wallonia, but I don't know that there are a lot of private clients uh, because um, I think in, in other countries it's really different um, and, and because of that there are many commissions and architects uh, <laughs> are able to start offices uh, yeah. also in Flanders. Um, so that's also the reason I think we talk about these projects because it's sort of continuous flow from the beginning of starting our office until now that we have commissions like, like these. Um, but I have to say like um, Although like there is a lot of subjectivity still because every client has its own wishes and requirements, we we also feel that th there is an awareness coming up that um, a house is also a sort of investment and um, that yeah when you kind of make a very specific architecture for, for um, maybe it's not so interesting for another for a next um, uh, nuclear family to come and live within this project so. I think that's maybe also a bit of the developers that are taking over the markets and they also think like that. So also people start thinking like that. So if we buy this apartment or this house, we should be able to kind of sell it again at some point. And that's actually not so, maybe there are bad things about developers or the fact that the developers are taking over. But, but maybe the good thing is like, we also feel kind of, um, we think of, of architecture in, in a way that it should, um, outlive the, the inhabitants yeah. and, and in that sense sometimes we can also convince the client in the story or, or, or even sometimes the client comes uh, with this, this request. So Which brings us back to the question of being generic. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Are there other remarks or other questions? Yes, there's another question. Yeah. For me, I, I think I'm personally talking, uh, I don't know about Rich, but I think this is sort of a glorification of the ugliness and the, this sort of a bricolage of Belgium is really uh, not the way to go. I think it's really like a sort of a hiding a bit with the sort of romanticizing uh, the condition. And we really, I think, start really believing from uh, the change from within, like uh, how can uh, each project make a sort of uh, change and, and not glorify uh, and uh, create a spectacle about it, yeah. this condition. I, I think on, on that note also that one of the key things about Flanders and the, let's just say the suburbs in general is also you that conditioning that of the association of house in the suburbs is so ingrained in, in, in Flemish people that it is hard to unroot it from that association. So to have a huge one of mass rollout of policy changes is near impossible in that sense. So in by introducing these kind of like uh, neighborhood maps, it's really a way of kind of like introducing the possibility of living together. Not like a crazy thing all at once, but you know, hey, there is a possibility for this kind of things to sort out the Flemish territory. Let's just do it one at a time kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a softer approach to that problem. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But I think I, we are also aware of, of course, of the fact that we make these, these maps, but it's, I, for us as architects, we can only work with the projects that we get commissioned and do we really want to also 
express ourselves above the, 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 the plot, let's say. But we also, of course, understand that it's not about only the architecture, but also the mentality of people mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they want to claim and, and their, their own plots that we also know is so strong that um, we can only kind of trigger people with our work yeah. Yeah. and even maybe also the policy makers to, to go to a slightly, uh, to slightly change maybe the way of, of living together. Because like for so long, like the policy makers have actually installed this way of living, not only in Flanders, but all over the world. So it's like the ownership, like the, the family, like it's also like you have to, people try to conform to, the, to, the, to what society ex expects from them. And, and so that's at some point they need their own proper house in suburbia. And I, I think maybe now it's, it's maybe not as much as, as, as back in the days, uh, but it's still present. So, this idea of success once you have, once you live in a, in a villa. And a confirmation of success. Yeah. 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 Okay, I think this is a, a very nice quote to, to end this, this lecture, unless there are other remarks or questions from the public. And uh, I would like to thank you again for, uh, for this lecture. Thank you again also for coming. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for VAI. Uh, Uh, it was for uh, hosting this. So, um, well, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you.